Uh, my name is Todd Sevig, and I am Director of uh, Counseling and Psychological Services, which on our campus is the Student Counseling Center, called CAPS, and I am honored and proud to be one of the co-chairs of this conference, along with John and um, Daniel Eisenberg. And I have the distinct pleasure right now to introduce our closing keynote, um, presented by Dr. Elizabeth Gongai. Um, Liz is actually a a very close colleague um, of myself and many uh, counseling center directors around the country. And uh, when I knew that she accepted her offer to come, I was uh, very happy. Um, so a little bit about uh, Liz. Dr. Gongai is Executive Director of Campus and Student Resilience at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she oversees evidence-based resilience and mental health promotion programs for the campus, including the Resilience Peer Network within the UCLA Depression Grand Challenge. Um, Elizabeth is a clinical psychologist with a lifelong commitment to community psychology and culturally accessible mental health service delivery to traditionally underserved populations. And from 2005 to 2015, uh, she directed UCLA's Counseling and Psychological Services, which is their student counseling center. Um, and uh, from 2013 to 2015, she was president of our National Association of Counseling Center Directors called the Association for University and College Counseling Center Directors. And uh, from my perspective, did a wonderful job being a president for that brief time. Uh, and led our organization of approximately a thousand people from around the country um, and just did a wonderful job. Uh, she has served um, in the past on the University of California Student Mental Health Oversight Committee and numerous working groups uh, all across UCLA, the UC system, the California Psychological Association, and uh, APA, the American Psychological Association. Uh, she earned her uh, bachelor's in psychology from Stanford and her PhD in clinical psychology from UCLA. And she is here to talk about, as the slide uh, says, strategic engagements, the depression grand challenge and resilience peer network at UCLA. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Gongai. Thank you, Dr. Sevig. I am really, truly um, honored and delighted to be here. And uh, I miss my colleagues at the Counseling Center desperately. So you have to send my regards to everyone, my love and regards. So I am, in fact, really very much honored to be here and uh, delighted that it was snowing when I was walking for the last two days. <laughs> I've never done that before. <laughs> and, I didn't really know that it was, I, I actually feel more resilient now as a result, <laughs> having mastered that challenge. <laughs> I am uh, actually very grateful to uh, <clears throat> the Depression on College Campuses Conference and the conference organizers, the University of Michigan's uh, Depression Center, for their work, and, and really especially Stephanie Salazar for um, working with me to get me here. Um, she's been remarkably patient. Um, I'm thankful for my colleagues also uh, at UCLA for allowing me to be here. I'm thankful for their fellowship, for their brilliance, for their good work, which I will be sharing with you today. I'd like to start with something for myself and for you. Um, just a little mindfulness of breath before we proceed. So if we could just all together take a moment, keep our eyes open, shut them, focus uh, just really for a moment on one breath in, one breath out, naturally without altering any aspect of that breath. Allowing ourselves to settle into this moment together. And focusing together now 
as we return uh, to this moment and the slides, which will move us forward. So I'm going to start with talking about how our resilience initiative began at uh, UCLA. CAPS had gone through significant growth in the 10 years that I was the director. We went from um, a staff of about 14 clinicians to a staff of more than, when I stepped away, we had 50 psychologists and nine FTE psychiatrists uh, and a couple of social workers. So it was a very large counseling center serving about, um, in, at the beginning of 2015 when I um, transitioned over into this new office, we were serving about 23% of our student population, which is about 84,000 students. Um, we've grown since then, the campus has, but not the counseling center. Um, AUCCD, I was aware, um, our national um, counseling center directors association made me acutely aware of the growth of uh, demand uh, across the nation and actually globally uh, on college college campuses. Um, the need for mental health services really grew astronomically over the 10 years that I was the director and active with AUCCD. And I really felt that at, toward the end of that period when I was director, in the last year and a half, two years, when I was um, really serving as a mental health advocate for our campus, for our county, for our state, for um, really everyone I could get to listen to me, um, felt really successful advocating for an increase in regents funding for the University of California system, all 10 campuses, significantly increasing the funding for mental health to all of the campuses, but then ultimately was confronted with uh, the fact that our Regents, although they were very supportive, had no appetite for fully funding the growing need for services that we were delivering traditionally. And that's the point of departure for me from the Counseling Center into uh, this new resilience office which we started. So, in those past two decades from that uh, we've all witnessed, if you've been um, paying attention to what's been going on, we've gone from stress management to wellness to resilience, trying to build our promotion, mental health promotion services. And I think we've done them well across all of our campuses, uh, many of our campuses at least, uh, with programs designed to increase knowledge and skills in managing stressors across every imaginable, imaginable domain. Um, so I was going to start, but then realized that I can't do this all in the, in the hour that I have with you, and I'm trying to leave time for questions. Um, so I was gonna start with a truly whirlwind tour of UCLA student services, but then I decided I can't do that. <laughs> Um, but I will leave the PowerPoint for you, and you can take yourself on a whirlwind tour of UCLA's resources for students, and it is really quite remarkable. Um, we have programs designed to address health, wellness, and resilience for our entire community, recognizing truly that beyond students, um, the values that support wellness and resilience are most powerfully promoted when they are expressed consistently across students, faculty, and staff, and the broader communities that we serve. So beyond our orientations for undergraduates and transfers and our remote and on-site international student orientations, our uh, multiple graduate student orientations, and all of the different individual school um, orientations, we have throughout the year, throughout student affairs, um, services that 
serve between, well, we'll serve virtually every student who comes on campus um, with a lot that doesn't have that much to do directly with their academic lives, um, but that's of course intended to support everything about um, students' lives as they progress with us. Let's see, I'm gonna go forward here. So with so many members of our campus community engaged in wellness and resilience building, where are we really? We have really, really effectively um, working with the state, working with all of our UC Counseling Center directors and, and um, across the University of California uh, system and with our California State University system um, Counseling Center directors come together to build a lot of resources and sh we've done a lot of resource sharing and you, you can see some of that work throughout California uh, in mental health promotion. But where are we all? Well, we have each of us on our campuses, more students seeking treatment for their emotional challenges and it's primarily anxiety and depression as you know. Our, all of our overburdened counseling centers devote their limited resources to really the, the severely ill students in acute crisis with fewer appointments available for less severe students. Now that's not true in every campus, but it's true on most campuses and it is definitely, most definitely true at UCLA. We have at UCLA 25 care managers that provide targeted comprehensive case management for a lot of our students, in addition to what the departments individually routinely provide um, to support students. So resilience was a new starting point for our redirected efforts. Campus and student resilience was conceived as a dissemination point for resilient skills training in partnership with others on campus. Our work is actually all accomplished in strategic engagements um, and partnerships. So we have a resilience peer network integrated into the UCLA Depression Grand Challenge. I'm gonna spend the bulk of my presentation talking about that in the hopes that you're, um, you're convinced, you're entranced by and want to engage with us in this part of the Depression Grand Challenge. But we also have other major programs. So Mindful UCLA is one of our programs and that brings together certified mindfulness trainers with UCLA's Mindful Awareness Resource Center, Research Center. Um, and now we have Resilience Peer Network alumni who've become faculty who are working with uh, our resident expert, the psychologist that I work with, Dr. Pimentel, to incorporate mindfulness into classroom pedagogy. We have resilient skills training for special needs uh, that are targeted throughout the year in our yoga series and we have multi-session resilient skills workshops which are delivered not in our offices but everywhere but our offices. We have resilient skills and growth mindset training for staff and faculty to inform their interactions with, this, with the students that they serve. We do a lot of cross-training and we are actually co-located with Resilience Life staff. Um, so we are very much more accessible for students, for student groups, and we, we do a lot of cross-training um, with CAPS and with our Graduate Student Resource Center. We support new program development and uh, uh -oh. <laughs> I think I've done something bad to myself um, on this. We support new program development with the doctoral students uh, as they work on new initiatives that can support students more broadly. And uh, just in general, we're out presenting on campus as much as possible to drop um, resilient skills training into every possible corner of the campus. 
So I'm going to give you a sample of some of our core campus trainings in just the next few slides, um, just really quickly. It is the, just a little tiny slice of what we do. But the core resilience constructs that we tend to bring out onto the campus within our um, broader trainings are these. Um, we focus on grit, the disposition to pursue very long-term goals with passion and perseverance sustained over time. We really believe in sustaining things over time. Uh, that's how people build skill. We don't actually believe so much in the power of workshops, one-time workshops. Uh, really, we, we try never to do, if possible. Uh, we recognize conscientiousness and self-control as core resilience traits unfortunately, um, the ability to resist momentary distractions or temptations to reach a goal, uh, and, and prudent, well-organized, dependable, persistent action. Um, those are traits, but they turn out to be not just traits and dispositions, but somewhat learnable if they are um, an intentional focus, an intentional named focus. And supporting all of that is growth mindset, believing that learning and determination are stronger success predictors than innate talent. And we count on conscientiousness and self-control to um, be learnable. So the other part of what we focus on a lot, um, and if we were going to do a little mini workshop, which we never do, but um, we embed this in a lot of the material that we send out and uh, continue talking um, in groups, every group that we can find with. Uh, growth mindset and resilience. The, brains, the idea that brains change with effort and experience. Growth mindset capitalizes on failure as a catalyst for growth. So if you think success is the result of hard work, then failure inspires you to do more. Whereas having a fixed mindset leads you to believe that smart people don't need to work hard, so failure itself is demoralizing. We know that growth mindset supports the rupture and repair framework of emotional and microaggression resiliency skill development. That's really helpful for us in an environment where we are focusing increasingly on inclusivity and uh, reducing the impact of microaggressions on our campus. And we really believe and teach that learning growth mindset supports students becoming effective learners again after setbacks. So fundamentally, and we, I use this language with everyone who will listen to me, neuroplasticity supports both growth and healing. The evidence is strong and compelling. So it's not just that these are words and concepts that we can float that sound good, but our brains are actually changing. Neuroplasticity is a real thing and uh, it supports the work that we do. Growth mindset operationalizes optimism. And it's a great way to think about the work that we all do. So what are the five science-backed strategies that I, I push to our uh, students, faculty, and staff? One is to rewrite the narrative. Uh, engage in expressive writing. Find those silver linings. Uh, it's an enorm it's a, an impactful way to approach um, setbacks. Two is face your fears. So we believe very much in exposure therapy techniques. And uh, one of those is getting up in front of people and speaking as your tech <laughs> dissolves to a blank screen. <laughs> uh, snow and blank screen. Um, a third is practicing self-compassion, uh, starting with being mindful, remembering that you're not alone, being as kind to yourself as you intend to be toward others. Another is, the fourth is meditating. Uh, and we actually do a lot of meditation practice, mindfulness practice, uh, contemplative practices, training, on our campus, it's a core part of every meeting that we hold. And then the fifth 
of the five science-backed strategies is cultivating forgiveness, letting go of anger through compassion. I love them. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is actually true. The only reason why you're getting to see any of this is because of them. <laughs> Good? Okay, so you know all of this. <laughs> so how do we go about supporting these re resilience initiatives? We, we do have pr grit pair coaches, and they actually go out and, and do this resilience work. And the grit pair coaches aren't even a part of my department. They never have been. They started, uh, they started two years before, three years before my office came into existence. But they're fabulous. They get out and engage with students uh, in a coaching style. Uh, and they mainly focus on exercise to boost cognitive functioning and mood regulation. They focus a lot on getting people to our meditation and yoga uh, classes that are all over campus. But the core of what we bring out to the rest of the campus um, is an encouragement and technical assistance and materials to incorporate science-based practices and programs. And that's, I've already pretty much gone through this, but growth mindset training is one very easy kernel to um, plant in a lot of different places. Protecting sleep is a, a little mini, we've got an infographic that we distribute and we typically, in the course of a year, we'll have, have at least one sleep event uh, through our Healthy Campus Initiative that um, promotes protecting sleep. We do mindful awareness training in a lot of places all over our campus with um, our partners through the, our Mindful Awareness Research Center. And we do emotional, emotion regulation skills training. A lot of that is done through CAPS, but we do that in, in other settings as well, uh, including within the resilience peers. And uh, we focus a lot on flourishing and gratitude. Um, Reminding, the, reminding everyone of the science-based practice of um, thinking of three, writing down three things every day that you're thankful for. Really straightforward, very easy practice, and uh, one that pays off in, uh, in uh, more happiness. Um, and it is a, a really easy resilience practice to engage in. So we work across campus to bring these actionable, evidence-based resilience skills concepts and training to students, staff, and faculty. But central to our work is the Depression Grand Challenge um, and our engagement with the Grand Challenge um, with our Resilience Peer Network. The Resilience Peer Network itself independently serves as a prevention and depression grand challenge advocacy network to bring resilient skills to the student population, but also to connect students to the study. What would happen if our greatest shared burden was lifted? Depression is the leading cause of disability, affecting over 300 million people around the globe. We lose 800,000 each year to suicide, more than murder and war combined. Yet we face an impossible void due to the desperate lack of resources in much of the world, leaving most of the suffering untreated. Now consider this, most people with depression can be diagnosed and actually treated using new technologies. In the smartphone and internet age, we see an enormous opportunity. We are building a global depression network to provide culturally adapted methods for diagnosing, treating, and continuously monitoring depression. We're calling it the Depression Grand Challenge worldwide. And when we launch, this global coalition will become the largest data collection effort ever in the field of mental health, unleashing untold insights that will fundamentally change our capacity to treat depression, sending lifelines that will transform hundreds of millions of lives. What would happen if our greatest shared burden 
was lifted? How would it feel? How would our world be transformed? And that is our Depression Grand Challenge. It's our trailer. Um, and that's Michelle Krask. She's one of our principals in the Depression Grand Challenge. She's on our executive team. She's a clinical psychologist from UCLA and uh, is a department co-chair this year. We have gathered up our resources um, at UCLA under our um, Chancellor's Grand Challenge initiative. It's the second of two Grand Challenges uh, that our Chancellor, Jean Block, uh, has raised for the campus. And the Depression Grand Challenge started with some seed money from the Chancellor and has grown into uh, just in uh, just a very short time, three or no, maybe four or five years. Uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you right now, just as quickly as I can. Is this, am I, is it up? It's on there. Ah. Okay. So I have to get coordinated here. Um, but this, I'm, I'm just walking you really quickly through the website because it'll speak more quickly than I do. Um, so this is the landing page for the website for the Depression Grand Challenge. And you can see here that we list uh, it's the number one source of misery in the world. 50% of people remain um, who are treated. No, 50% of people who have... Oh, 50% of people treated remain depressed. Now that's problematic. Um, and there are a million suicides per year. Depressive disorders are found in one in four women, one in six men. And it's not just in our heads. It's a real problem that's as old as humanity. Uh, we still don't even know what, it ca what causes it, although we go about trying to treat it. Uh, and that's why we have brought together uh, scientists on our campus, but in combination with, in partnership um, with scientists all over the world to address this problem. So there are four elements of this. I'm gonna go, I'll go back to another slide in a minute. Um, but the idea is that we have world-class expertise the ability to collaborate across continents, across the country certainly, but across continents, and uh, to really look at the, at the problem differently from how we have been approaching it in the past. Let's see. So there are four main objectives to the Depression Grand Challenge. One is to collect a sample of 100,000 participants to better understand the underlying mechanisms of depression. You need a huge sample to do that. We'd like to try to tap into the biological, neurological, and genetic bases of depression. And so part of this discovery neuroscience uh, portion of the Depression Grand Challenge looks to uh, understand the phenotypes of depression. We want to address the stigma associated with depression, which of course everyone here is committed to. And we want to create an innovative treatment network. We have created an innovative treatment network that tackles depression with a tiered treatment approach. The student ICBT study is part of the Innovative Treatment Network. And, oops, I wanna go back to this. It's, it's the first large-scale implementation of the, so the study that we are doing right now, that is the, actually the major piece of what I'm gonna share with you for the rest of the time I'm up here. It's the first large-scale implementation of this, um, and it focuses on the UCLA undergraduate and graduate student populations. 
So to give you an overview of what we'll be discussing, I'm going to provide an overview of the Innovative Treatment Network and how the student ICBT study fits into it. And then I'm going to dive into the core components of the student ICBT study. After that, I'm going to discuss the details of the student study design as quickly as I can. And then finally, I'll present a quick overview of our current numbers and our impact to date. We have not been going long. Um, I've been in this office since, well, for less than three years. Um, we started the Resilience Peer Network at the beginning of 2016. Um, we were in our, our waiting for IRB approvals for a year <laughs> and began um, collecting data in January of 2017. So we have a year's worth of data, which I will share with you. So our peer-supported, again, I said this before, our peer-supported ICBT treatment studies among the current human studies within the DGC's Innovative Treatment Network. I'm going to scroll through really quickly on this site. Again, you can get to all of these sites um, to show you some of the other studies that are part of the Innovative Treatment Network, or no, part of the human studies. So we're conducting um, a series of studies that will enable us to, number one, identify the genetic, biological, cognitive, social, and environmental factors associated with depression, and then number two, implement an innovative and comprehensive treatment strategy. But these are all part of the, um, the human studies projects. So here is the student study um, to evaluate the effectiveness of an ICBT program that's supported by peers. I'll tell you more about why we do it that way. Uh, participation is strictly voluntary, uh, and we intend in the coming year to uh, screen our entire UCLA student population, which we're aware has its drawbacks because we also intend to provide treatment to all of those students who are identified with unmet treatment needs. Um, there's a biomarkers of depression in sweat study that quickly gathered enough sweat to fulfill their intended end. Um, there's a biomarkers of response to total de sleep deprivation in major depressive disorder study that's still going, a serial ketamine treatment, and these are for treatment-resistant major depression. Um, there's a study that focuses on um, biomarkers of response to electroconvulsive therapy in um, major depressive disorder. Shared mechanisms of depression and migraine is one of our studies. There's a virtual reality study for the treatment of anhedonia. And then there's an imaging-guided transcranial direct current stimulation study, um, again, for treatment-resistant depression. We need volunteers. <laughs> and we have staff studies as well. Um, so right now, we're doing uh, large-scale screening for mood disorders in the UCLA community. Uh, the staff and faculty can join that. Um, there's a longitudinal assessment of mood disorders at UCLA. Actually, all of these are now closed to enrollment. We were doing an effectiveness of internet cognitive behavioral therapy for depression and anxiety in the UCLA community, and I was the PI on that, but that also is closed because we only have so much energy. No, because we are focusing on the students. The student study really exploded, and and so we um, have put a pause on some of these other studies to focus on students just for the time being. So our UCLA student study, um, I'm gonna kind of whip through some of the details on this. Lots of, lots of, well, you'll see. Um, my objective is to dive into the details of the screening, the research, the treatment, the infrastructure that supports this approach, and 
to use that as a guide for others in this room who might be interested, might take back to their, um, their universities uh, some sustained interest in adopting a similar program. And we would love to partner with you because we truly are uh, hoping to build quickly to um, 100,000 participants in our studies. So central to the ITN, the Integrated Innovative Treatment Network, is a tiered treatment approach. That means that students are routed to an appropriate level of care based on their current symptom severity. This is being developed and implemented in the study that I'm doing with Dr. Krask. Um, students are routed based on, on their current symptom severity um, or from other campus resources, but everyone has to come into the study through an online screening survey. And then the treatment offered is intended to match symptom severity in order to avoid wasting resources and to make better use of the resources that we do have. This, in the student study, the key components are a CAT M M computer adaptive test for mental health. It's an online screening. Uh, the This Way Up ICBT program, the Resilience Peer Network, and then behavioral health tracking. I'm going to whip quickly through these. Um, so I'm going to, the best way for me to explain how the ITN is implemented through the student study is to walk you through the experiences of a student or a sad cat. So the cat would see one of our flyers or, or receive an email inviting them into the study. They'd go online, um, they could do it through any device. Um, and take the screening, and they would get immediate individualized feedback. They would then be offered the opportunity, if they're eligible, to schedule an orientation interview immediately. Then they would hang out <laughs> until that date. <laughs> then after they did their orientation interview and came on to the study, they would start the ICBT, the Internet Delivered Program, hang out some more, <laughs> and in the end, <laughs> be largely recovered from their depression. <laughs> All right. You know, research assistants are amazing. <laughs> This is Belinda Chen's work. She's fabulous. All right. Um, okay, so another element is the, whoops, I just went backwards. Um, the CAT MH online screening. CAT is not really CAT, but anyhow, computer adaptive test for mental health. Uh, developed by Robert Gibbons at the University of Chicago, one of our collaborators. It's based on multidimensional item response theory. Uh, we're looking at major depressive disorder. Um, we're looking at a dimensional uh, measure of depression, gives us severity, anxiety, mania, and suicidal uh, symptoms. It was validated in community outpatient settings, and uh, it's actually extremely robust. It reduces the burden of empirically based assessment. So. Uh, in the space of about between five and 12 minutes, we can have an individual assessed in what would be the equivalent of a three hour assessment. Um, I'm certain a fast reader could do a, a 90 minute assessment of the same items, although this pulls from a, a 1200 item uh, pool. Uh, it's designed it, it's an alternative to test theory. So we're not administering, we're not administering except for validation purposes, uh, a PHQ or a DAS or any of the other um, instruments that many of us are, are more accustomed to administering. We are doing that, we're, we have done that for a year now. We've finished our validation study. We will now go forward um, with only using the CAT MH, so that the burden of the um, assessment is really significantly reduced. A highlight of our screening is that participants are immediately presented with individualized feedback 
always, um, as soon as they're done with the screening, the students can see where their scores fall in relation to other students' scores. And if this was a live screen um, and I could scroll down, it would show that I could click for additional information and access a list of our campus resources directly from the feedback screen. Let's say that the, this screening, this participant screening, um, finds that the students' scores fall in tier one or tier two, mild depression or moderate depression. That would make the student eligible to enter the ICBT study. Um, and the treatment that they would get is this way up developed by Gavin Andrews. It's a transdiagnostic uh, approach <clears throat> as effective as symptom-specific treatments for depression and anxiety. And it is, it, it's evidence-based, it's extremely efficacious. Um, so treatment effects at three-month follow-up are held and there are moderate to large effect sizes, meaning that it's an effective treatment. Um, we actually, independently, there were three groups of us that, that researched several initiatives and determined at the time when we chose this that thiswayupclinic.org was the best tool to move the Depression Grand Challenge forward. And so um, Gavin Andrews, who's pictured here, it, uh, came onto our team. And he, he runs a not-for-profit initiative to provide evidence-based autom automated CBT over the internet. Um, and he works out of Sydney. This is an example of, whoops, this is a screen that, um, that you get it in, the, in the program to choose which lessons to go to. Uh, this Way Up is, is structured as six lessons, and each is done over the course of one week. Each lesson follows two cartoon characters, Rob and Liz, conveniently Liz, um, as they deal with their symptoms of depression and anxiety, and they employ ICBT skills to tackle and manage their symptoms. And after each PowerPoint style, it's not really PowerPoint, it's much better than PowerPoint style lesson, the participants download a robust multi-page homework that helps them to apply the lessons that they learned in the ICBT to their real lives. In the, cont the content of the homework and the lesson are then discussed in one-on-one -on -one peer support, either with a resilience peer, if the, if the participant is in the mild depression range, or with a graduate student clinician who's part of the resilience peer network, um, depending really on the level of severity. This is an example of the actual content of each lesson. Um, so, you know, sometimes the characters explain aspects of, of uh, how to conceptualize depression in a CBT world. Um, we have, we get to read the thought bubbles of the, uh, this is Rob, um, thinking through their own reactions. Uh, each lesson is structured so that there are didactics about the CBT skills at the beginning of the lesson, and then Rob and Liz illustrate the didactics on their own lives. Now, who supports this? Well, the Resilience Peer Network does, and it's a collective of UCLA undergraduates and graduate students that are actually, they've gone through a full quarter of training on fundamental support skills, and they have also, um, done additional training, I'll, I'll detail more of that in a second. Uh, we, I and Dr. Pimentel and a cohort of graduate students in clinical psychology who receive supervision, in supervision, from us, um, we all, the faculty, support fellow students as well as the DGC student study staff. So they're, they're really, there's a small army of people who are supporting this um, this effort. The resilience peers get tr training in the skills that are listed here. And the training is presented in three sequential and cumulative quarters of training and clinical supervision. So in the first quarter, they get a, spa a basic skill seminar for 90 minutes. They do the ICBT lesson on their own whenever. It takes about 45 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes. And then they go to a weekly support group 
and that weekly support group is facilitated by more senior resilience peers who have received, are, who are receiving supervision for that. So that's quarter one. In the second quarter, the resilience peers enter uh, intensive role play supervision. And they also learn to and get certified for um, delivering research orientations. So they become part of the research, whoops, sorry, the research framework in interviewing students who are interested in coming into the ICBT study who are eligible. And they help set them up on the equipment and um, provide some reassurance, allay some fears about confidentiality. Um, and then uh, the, the students begin the, the treatment study. <clears throat> so that's what happens in the research orientations. In the third quarter, there's clinical supervision. The, um, in, delivered once a week, there's small group supervision, six to eight students in each supervision group. The responsibilities for the study include doing the research orientations, but then now the resilience peers begin to facilitate support groups. And those support groups are often combined support groups with new resilience peers learning the ICBT material and study participants learning the ICBT materials. Since they are all together, we used to have them separately. We decided that we would meld them because, in fact, they're going through and learning the same materials. They're all peers. and. It's a protected environment. <clears throat> and then in the fourth quarter, they continue in clinical supervision. And this is actually true for all remaining quarters. So resilience peers can stay in forever. Um, well, they have to eventually graduate. But short of graduation, they can stay in forever. Uh, and they can, once they are fully certified as uh, certified resilience peers, they can continue to provide research orientations if they choose. They can continue to lead support groups if they choose. And they can now provide one-on-one -on -one peer support delivered through video chat, uh, recorded into a secure environment and available for supervision. So all of these activities are closely supervised on a weekly supervision, small group supervision. Uh, for, the, for the duration of that resilience peer's engagement with the Depression Grand Challenge. The resilience peers master core competencies of training in order to move on to the next quarter of training. So it's not just a pass through. Another key component to this study is behavioral health tracking. You know a lot about this already but if, if you came to the um, the opening keynote. Um, the, the huge advantage of behavioral health tracking here is that it's passive. Uh, GPS, smartphone use logs, um, and call logs. We're looking at uh, geolocation. We're looking at sleep, wake, onset. We're looking at uh, uh, social activity. So we're also looking Whoops, sorry. Physical activity, sleep activity, social activity. I didn't know that this was live. Um, okay, and then we also deliver the surveys through their devices so that they, um, they have to engage with us to tell us about their symptoms. So our behavioral health tracking goal is real-time integrated behavioral health tracking. And we hope at some point to be able to use the data that we're gathering now to reduce the amount of active, you know, entering of data uh, that any participant has to go through. If we can get the correlates, the, the other correlates, behavioral correlates, for um, what we're looking for, we won't have to ask the questions directly, we believe, eventually. So here's the research design. There are eligibility criteria, it's tiered treatment, and then there's an assessment schedule. I'm gonna share them really quickly. So the research design um, around eligibility, people need to own a smartphone. They has to have to be at least 18 years old. They have to be UCLA students at this point, and they must be fluent, or they must say they're fluent in English. It's interesting because a lot of our participants and a lot of our residents' peers are not so fluent 
Um, but that doesn't seem to be a barrier at this point. Um, so they can come into tier zero, tier one, two, or three of the study. Um, if they're in tier one, no elevated symptoms. Um, if they're in tier one, they have mild symptoms. You can review this at some point on your own if you'd like. Um, the tiered treatment, the student then separately agrees, has to decide to um, enter. So the online mental health screening determines uh, whether they're eligible and then if they decide they're going forward, they um, then move into one of the three tiers, one of the four tiers. Um, with each of these tiers, well, with tier, there's no treatment for tier zero, that's just tracking for the pleasure of being in the study and for being eligible for raffle prizes like $75 worth of groceries. We give away um, grocery store cards uh, once a week and the, the incentives build until I guess at the end of the year we give away a computer and something else. Um, but the, the more, the longer the student stays in the study, the, the bigger the prizes they can be eligible for. <clears throat> Let's see. Immediate risk response, they could trigger at any point because they're giving us all of that data. We follow that up immediately. That also can determine what level of the study they're eligible for. Their status is actually defined by risk. So if they are very high risk with severe symptoms, they would land in tier three and they would be offered treatment through our innovative treatment network clinic, which is direct one-on-one um, -on -one support, it's actually treatment from a psychiatry fellow and a psychology fellow. Oops, I'm going backwards now. All right. I think we did this already. Here we go. Um, so we designed the, the, the study to look at symptoms across severity levels. Since all the studies are ours, we can easily transition the participants from one tier to the next if they worsen. And since we know about their symptom worsening, we can move them actually quite quickly. We screen as often as every two weeks. There's a 10-month research study design with assessments that are aligned across tiers. We do data monitoring on an ongoing basis to ensure that uh, we're appropriately assessing risk. And we can transfer people quickly between tiers when it's needed. We have ongoing communication um, between the student participant and the research team and the clinical team um, with reminders that we deliver actually quite a lot to increase the completion rates. I'm going to skip this one, but basically we do a lot of surveys over 40 weeks. All right, so what are our numbers to date? I'm going to give you the something that we're actually quite proud of. Um, so in our first year, we have 45,000 students, and in 2017, um, we screened primarily from September on, because we, although we started in January, a lot of the January to, through the summer was tweaking things so that they worked right, and. Uh, just took a lot. So we, we actually, although we were operating, we brought in far fewer students because we were recruiting it carefully um, so that we wouldn't become overwhelmed as we were adjusting our, uh, our response network. But we began our actual recruitment in mid-September. So these numbers reflect mostly what happened after September through December, through the end of December. So we screened 3,347 students. Of that 3,347, uh, 1,269 were eligible for the study. 
685 signed up for the ICBT study. In this first year, we received and responded to, as a result of the screening, 102 suicide risk alerts, 86 mania alerts, and 136 severe depression alerts. And these are all people that we would not otherwise have reached um, had, had we not mounted the screening uh, in September. <clears throat> so these are the clinical measures. Um, you can see that the depression that's the blue line at the very top uh, significantly reduced, clinically significantly, so not just significantly as in, you know, um, not just probabilistically, but actually clinically significant increases in functioning um, and decreases in symptoms. For depression, um, for anxiety as well, uh, the mustard line. Um, mania was not as much of an issue, but that actually also improved, which we were a little bit surprised at because we didn't intend to treat mania. Um, and then we had the PHQ-9, the DAS, the DAS anxiety. Um, but they were there really to uh, confirm our, our readings of the CAT. So why uh, have so few completed? You can see that's an N of 134. Some of these students would not have been able to complete before the end of the year. So they are still in the study going forward. They just haven't had time to complete. Um, when there's some kind of contact, it remarkably improves completion rate. We know, we found out that email is not an effective form of communication with students. This is all terribly unfortunate. So now we are um, in the next phase of the study going to uh, do text messaging and FaceTime to increase rates of engagement and completion. Um, the study is designed to kind of learn from its mistakes as we move forward. So it's really iterative and we continuously update and improve. What we've seen through this first phase is that we're helping to address this unmet need, um, both in terms of identifying students at risk and routing them to resources, including our resources. And we're providing treatment that's suitable for students in tiers one and two, mild to moderately depressed and anxious students, that is effective in reducing the symptoms of depression and anxiety. And we have data from uh, just a limited number of treatment completers though, so this far. So our goals for next year, this current year, improving the rates of completion, increasing mobile-based communication, increasing student involvement, using dashboards for data access. We, currently, it's harder for students to get to their data uh, because it, we have to stay within a secure environment. We haven't figured out the data dashboards yet. And then um, we want to mount a campaign for hope and awareness on our campus. Um, there are a lot of people that I really do have to thank, but our executive committee is chief among them. But Eliza Congdon is our, uh, the head of our operational core. She's our project director. She's phenomenal and amazing, and she's a, a big part of the reason why our studies have moved forward. Um, I'm going to, no, I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to show you this anyhow, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not going to go to the website. I'm going to send you to our website on your own, um, but share with you some of the material that we have for our resilience peers. And these are res uh, recruitment materials for the study and for Resilience Peer Network. This is our Resilience Peer Network recruitment flyer. And I am going to just end with this really short film featuring some of our current, current and past resilience peers and uh, with little notes, post-it notes that we did at, a, at an event uh, where they just quickly summarize what they got from the experience. We've had about 300 resilience peers uh, in the last two years. Uh, many of our resilience peers have gone on to graduate. We have about 55 graduating out of our 82 um, this quarter. No, next quarter, at the end of this academic year. So we're, uh, again, every quarter, we're recruiting 
uh, to bring on another 30 to 60 um, each quarter. But we have a lot of engagement. We're very happy with the student part of this, and uh, it's been fabulous for us. Uh, I'm, that's all I'm saying. And I can entertain questions in the past. No. <laughs> because I know that we've run through our time. So please join me in thanking Thank you. Thank you. For a few minutes, I can stay until, yeah, my, my car is coming in 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're, we're 15 to the airport, but so, until then. We know that uh, some of you uh, need to uh, uh, leave and get travel arrangements, maybe get to the airport and so forth. But uh, Dr. Gongai will be here for a few minutes afterwards if anybody wants to come up and ask her questions. Uh, we do want to be respectful of your time, um, but I would like to offer just a few sentences as we close our 16th conference. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm actually filled with a lot of emotion, so uh, you, you might hear that in my voice right now. Um, I mean, we just had an example for the past hour of new, cutting-edge practices from around the country. Um, uh, but really, the day and a half has been filled with that. Um, and every year that we've had this conference, those of you who have been here before, I think you'll agree, we're filled with that. And so I want to really honor and give credit to all of us for participating in this day and a half. And at the same time, the other side of the coin, if you will, what's more important is what we do when we leave here. When we all go back to our campuses, our schools, wherever we're coming from, in whatever roles that we are in, that's the magic. That's the strength of this. It's wonderful to be together, have some good food together, and reconnect or make new connections. That is wonderful. At the same time, it is more wonderful what we all do when we leave here. And I really want to uh, just simply leave you with that. Uh, we all do that in our own way. Some of us will do it individually. I know there's uh, people, uh, multiple people from campuses, um, and so some of us will do that with each other. Um, uh, but in that way, it really is a pebble dropped in water that just ripples out and out and grows. And so I, I hope that you leave here with that renewed sense of knowledge, of passion, of spirit, of energy, and let's change the world. Um, I do want to uh, thank Stephanie Salazar and all the organizers for the conference. Uh, <laughs> if any of you have done that kind of job, you know it's just a million details, uh, and it's been so smooth. Um, and I also want to, you know, I'm up here maybe giving the last words of the day and a half, but. Um, John Graydon, um, who started us off, uh, needs to also uh, be thanked and recognized and he's sitting there. Um, it, 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 was, it started with his singular vision and he loves to uh, also say that it is a collective effort these last 16 years, which it has been, but it has started with you. So thank you to everybody, thank you to all of us, and um, safe travels wherever we're going. Thanks. <laughs>